Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another podcast on County Mitzvah's 22.com. Happy to be back in the saddle, uh, back from Rome. Uh, Rome, of course, is Rome. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's my favorite city in the world. I love going to Rome, but it was it was a bit of a slog this time because I was covering the uh, extremely boring Synod on Synodality, the big meeting on meetings, and uh, which, in my opinion, turned out to be a big nothing burger. Uh, kind of a fart in the wind as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and that is my hope that that's how it ends up. Sorry to be a little vulgar, but there it is. That's, that's the long and short of it. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I'm finally over my jet lag. I want to thank everybody that offered up prayers and support and and actually read my various ramblings and first things called Larry Chaps in a diary. A big shout out to George Weigel for for asking me to do that. Uh, and uh, to uh, Carl Olson for also publishing my stuff in Catholic World Report, which we'll get to in a second. Hey, by the way, my, my guest today, Dr. Rodney Hauser, everybody knows Rodney, my former colleague, uh, dear friend from DeSales University. But Rodney, you appreciate this because Rodney is also publishing now in Catholic World Report, which is what we're going to talk about soon. But yesterday, the one, the only Carl Olson, our mutual editor at, at Catholic, Catholic World Report, was at my humble abode, my little farm. He was in Pennsylvania visiting. Uh, well, he was at a conference at St. Vincent's in Latrobe. Then he was visiting his sister, who lives about an hour from me, and he made the trek to the farm. And I have to say, in person, he's a real jerk, a bit of a I, I can't stand him now. I will never write for Catholic World Report ever again. <laughs> no, actually, I, I made some chili and we and we had beer and chili. So it was it, it was uh, a musical afternoon sitting outside on the deck. Let's just say that <laughs> it was fun. No, great. Carl's great. It was great to finally meet him in person. I'd never met him in person. And so, Carl, if you're listening, big shout out to you. Thank you for coming. Anyway, lots of new uh, interviews coming up. This is my first podcast in about three or four weeks. I've got some more Comunio podcasts coming up and uh, some others. So just stay tuned. Also, some writing I'm going to be doing on various things. And I am not going to be writing anymore on the Synod on Synodality. May it rest in peace. I If I never write one more word, if ever, another word on the Synod, on, I will be, I'll die a happy man uh, because I'm sick of it. And I know a lot of my readers voice support, but I know a lot of people are sick of me writing on it too. I'm kind of being tagged as the Synod dude. And I really hate that. Anyway, hey, welcome, Roddy. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Nice to be here. Yeah, well, very good. Took you a while to say that, but that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I trust all is well on your end. Now, oh, for those who don't know, Rodney is, uh, uh, are you still chair of the theology department? at DeSales No, I University? gave up that uh, wonderful yeah, that, job. Yeah. And who is now chair of the theology uh, department? Sarah, Sarah Hulse Kirby. Doc, yeah. Sarah Hulse Kirby, Dr. Sarah yeah. Hulse in my old office. Yes, yes. in my old office. Yep. All right. But Rodney has suddenly in the past couple of months, exploded onto the world scene by writing now a couple of articles in Catholic World Report. And that's what prompted me to want to do this podcast, because he has an article that came out uh, maybe th what was it, three days, four days ago now uh, in Catholic World Report on on secularism. Uh, what, what? Gosh, I had the title of it right in front of me. What's the title, Hauser? Come on. The secularism can... and the divisions in the church. Is that right? I got it right here. Secular modernity and the divisions in the church, yeah, secular modernity and the divisions in the church. Uh, and so why do what? First off, I'm going to get uh, obviously the title is kind of self-explanatory. It's going to be it's an article essay, a couple thousand words on secular modernity and how this has affected the various divisions in the church. And in some ways, yeah, it has a bearing on this crazy synod that just ended and so on. So what? Let's let's begin. Number one, what's the main thesis of the essay? And number two, what prompted you to write this? Um, yeah, so so I probably what what prompted me to write it actually is 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 the kind of stuff the, the the stuff coming out of the synod to some degree, and and the and the various factions that are still uh, you know as you've been pointing out in your pieces, these are the factions that go back to the right after the council the the, the you know the different schools of thought uh, trying to retrieve the council in, in various ways. And it's, it seems to me that things are different now. 
it, it, I mean, that is the, the difference is that there, there have always been schools of thought in the church. And sometimes the battles between those schools have been fierce, um, as you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, between the Scotists and the Thomists or between the, you know, the Augustinians uh, on, on predestination and then various defenders of free will, you know, throughout the church's history, um, between the uh, Jesuits on this regard and the Dominicans uh, on this very issue of predestination and grace and, and all these things. What is different now, however, it seems to me, is that the dialogue between the church and the modern world, right, and, and, and the modern world with its, you know, secularist, naturalist, materialist tendencies. Yeah. It seems to me now is that one of those factions is actually also in the church, so to speak. Right. Yeah. So so it so it seems to me that what's happening is the debate between, say, let's say traditional Thomists and then people like us in the Communio school, both of whom accept the authority of revelation, accept the authority of tradition, et cetera, et cetera, on the one hand. And then the progressives in the church that want to see greater and greater <laughs> accommodation with secular modernity. It, it's 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 almost like the, the we don't have the same first principles with these people. The Scotists and the Thomists had differences, but they accepted the again the authority of revelation, the articles of faith, et cetera, et cetera. But it almost seems now as if one faction in the church is giving authority to something that we've never given authority to before. And let's call it whatever modern experience, you know, wh whatever you want to call it. And so that's what provoked me to write this. It's just a kind of um, frustration yep. at the fact that the debate <clears throat> doesn't even feel like a theological debate to me. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. And you bring yeah. that out in the essay. And, yeah. and not to, you know, turn this into a conversation about me and about what I wrote, but I wrote in first things in my last synod diary that that came yes. out, I think, yesterday. Yeah. Uh, something very, very similar, which is I, re I read it this morning. Yeah. You know that, geez, come on. The, the, you know, we got this wonderful thing, uh, which, is, uh, as Cardinal Mueller said, the synod is essentially a gigantic theological symposium more than it's actually a synod. OK, fine. That's what it was. So we had a perfect opportunity to hash out some really nettle some theological issues that continue to vex the church, and one of which is the development of doctrine uh, and how that because you know, God is doing a new thing and we're developing the doctrine on sex and we're developing the doctrine in ordinary ordination. Well, how and, and does that square up with what came before? So in other words, I view this synod as a colossal missed opportunity to maybe point us in the direction, finally, of a resolution of a debate that's been going on all the way back to Newman and further back, as you point out, about what, const what how do you adjudicate between true and false development of doctrine? Right. And what you just said it nails it, nails it, that the problem is that we've got factions within the church that have incommensurate starting points. Yes. That they have fundamentally different sets of non-negotiables as right. as the as their starting points and yeah. and to a great extent the progressive wing of the church those non-negotiables those starting points seem more drawn from the secular domain the, from at least the values that secular modernity espouses yeah than it does sort of with traditional catholicism seems to me no that that's absolutely right and again that's what i was i, I was trying to get at, and i was thinking about this uh this morning um you know, the early church is is in the Roman Empire, and it's very, very obvious that the Christians have an entirely different value system, right? I mean, if you think about that, it's it's interesting to think about the Sermon on the Mount. When it occurs, it occurs precisely when, when the Roman Empire is at the height of its libido dominandi. You know what I mean? I mean, they're, they're, they're powerful, they, they have status, they have pleasure, they have money, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And here comes little Jesus along to tell everybody that it's the exact opposite. Like it's the meek, it's the, it's the lowly, it's the humble, yeah. you know, all yeah. these different things. And it's so obviously a clash of fundamental values clash. It's a, it's a whole worldview clash because precisely it's, it's because of their rotten gods that they have a rotten politics because they, their politics is based on yeah. 
overgrown, overgrown frat boy gods that they worship, right? So, and Augustine, of course, get, gets at this in the in the City of God. Um, that actually helps the church to really figure out who it is, um, because they have a foil, right? They're, they're like, well, we know yeah. we're not that. So, what are yeah. we? And then yeah. and so the, the kind of the kind of transvaluation of values that happen in in, in the person of Jesus Christ. The church kind of embraces that as its identity. Its identity is to be, is to turn the values on their head. And just in little things that you know about church history, like during that plague in Rome where the Christians stayed and took care of their sick, but even the pagan sick, that was a big turning point because yeah. they embarrassed the pagans. They were like, well, why didn't we stay and take care of our sick? You know, like, and there's almost yeah. a envy of, of the, you know, the thing. I think we actually need something like, like that right now in the church. Like the reason I don't think the church has a very good understanding of itself right now is because it's it's been so confused by the values of Western secularism that it no longer realizes how different its values are. And that's, uh, you know, that's, I mean, I, that's probably something we've talked about before, but it's, it seems extremely important to me that we realize that what the church means by, say, freedom, what the church means by nature what the church yeah. means by a human person have very, very different meanings than the kind of worldview that comes out of um, classical liberalism and, and all those things are fundamental differences. Yeah. And those are the kinds of things that we need to be talking about in the church, but are not talking about in the church right. when we, because all of these uh, so-called hot button issues have uh, that cannot be resolved theologically until we examine precisely the sources of the like of the anthropology and the theology that that the various positions espouse. You know, and so, for example, you know, uh, we need to ordain women uh, in order for women to be equal in power in the church. Yeah. Is that a Christian attitude or, yes. or is that a secular attitude? Right. It, it begs the question of what constitutes power in yes. a Christian sense, what constitutes service in a Christian sense, yes. whether or not gender difference actually has sacramental theological, anthropological significance. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's so weird that you mentioned that particular case, because when I was writing that piece for a Catholic World Report, I gave one example about how both sides of the aisle, the conservative Catholics and the liberal Catholics, frame the ab abortion debate in terms of a right struggle between two individuals, which yeah. is so antithetical to the Catholic tradition. It's unbelievable. It's so hot. It is. Blocky and it's disgusting. But yeah. then I read this thing, somebody in the synod said, we need to empower women in the church. And the exact same thing pops into my head. Like, who talks this way? Yeah. Like, is it because as, as you said, Gloria first, Steinem oh, talks like that. Yeah, no, right. And, and so it begs the question, like, what is power? Right. That That's a good yeah. question, because it does look power is yeah. very different for a Christian. I mean, Jesus says to his disciples, yeah. you know, what does he say? The, the, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. But this is not how it should be among you. <laughs> Right. So in other words, already yeah. Jesus is saying the church is not about people being in power, right? About, you know, who's going to sit at your right hand when you come into your kingdom? Jesus, I want it to be me. You know, this is the nincompoop disciple fundamentally misunderstanding the nature of power, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and you see this, this is why, you know, we can also not just critique the progressive wing of, of the Catholic church in terms of their unexamined secularist mm -hmm. assumptions, right. ironically, the radical traditionalists uh, embrace a, an essentially modern view of power as yes. well here. And th there, because this, this is why their version politically of integralism is so flat footed. Christ is king. You know, nothing grates my nerves more when I hear a rad trad. Christ is king. Yeah, because yeah. I know what you mean by that. Yes, right. he's king. He reigns from the cross. He reigns yeah. from the cross. That's all right. right. Yes, he's risen from the dead, but he, he he's 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 the lamb who is slain from all eternity. That's right. Yes, he's king. But that doesn't mean he's the he's the Napoleon of the of the of the world. OK, right. Right. I mean, you get where I'm oh, Gosh, Absolutely. it just gets me. So anyway, I'm yeah. ranting and raving now, but maybe you could comment on on the traditionalist problem with this as well. No, that's exactly right. They're, they're, the traditionalists and the progressives almost create each other because they 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 end up wanting. They both want power, right? And they both misunderstand yeah. what it means. Both of them have. This is what my whole point of my article. We've allowed modern ways of thinking to to form even the way we think of our faith, 
But the faith is much bigger than modernity. And, and I think it's a really good exercise. C.S. Lewis said this, for every book written, a contemporary book you read, you, you should read two pre-modern books. Because we so live and eat and breathe the air of modernity that it gets into us in all sorts That's of ways right. already. And so when you read things that were written prior to modernity, they have a way of like, whoa, like that's a whole different way of looking at things. But to go back to the thing about empowering women, for instance, right? The assumption is that now it's the men who have power in the church, right? Yeah, yeah. But what does the what is the charism of the bishop? What what does it, it enable the bishop to do? It seems to me that it enables the bishop to be docile to the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't sound like power to me. It sounds like first docility, right? Yes. Which is why Paul boasts in the fact that he preaches a foolish gospel. He doesn't right. boast that he's wise or he's powerful. He boasts in his weakness. And he boasts in the stupid message he's been entrusted with by Jesus, that, that self-giving love is actually greater than the Roman Empire, right? It's a, it's a message that feels foolish on the, on the surface. Yeah. Let's empower women it, that's awful because we shouldn't even be empowering men in the sense that that is meant. Nobody should want that kind of power. Oh, this is right? so true. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So it's, in other words, it's a, it, it's a sociological reading of what it means to have authority in the church. When what authority in the church ought to mean and does mean in, in the documents is docility to the spirit. The spirit is the transcendent subject of tradition. It, it, the spirit is the first one to hand the faith on. And then the reason that priests and bishops need a charism is because it's above their pay grade. It's precisely because they don't have the power to grasp the message. So That's they right. need a gift of, of, of a special gift of the Holy Spirit to enable them to be able to teach the faith. Precisely because yeah. they're powerless to teach it on their own, right? That's exactly it's, right. Yeah. And so it's just, again, these reversal of values that go right back to the Sermon on the Mount are precisely what we're losing because we're all speaking as moderns. Yep. Just like it would have been a mistake for the Christians to speak as Romans, it, it's the, it's the, the, yeah, exactly. Well, the obsession yeah. of the of the of the church of the apostolic era, and then yeah. of the sub apostolic, their mm -hmm. obsession was sanctity and sainthood. Their yeah. obsession was the Holy Spirit. I mean, go back and read the news. We talk about reading pre-modern books. How about we resurrect in a strong, powerful way, Lexio Divina of the Holy Scriptures uh, for Catholics, because no, it, you, you cannot read the New Testament in Lexio Divina and not come away with this overwhelming sense that the first Christians believed in a very tangible, palpable way that the Holy Spirit was sanctifying them. And that this is the point to Christian service, Christian discipleship, the infusion of the spirit that Christ has sent after his ascension. This yeah. is critical. This is key. And whether or not you're a bishop, a, a prophet, a teacher, an apostoloi, a disciple, it didn't matter. You were all simply on that same journey uh, to that end. And I don't want to occupy the conversation. You talk about the difference of that same early church with the Roman paganism. That same Sermon on the Mount that you brought up and those same early Christian values were also at odds with a, a certain powerful strand within Judaism, the sort of rad trads of Judaism that, that had a kind of version of the gospel of wealth, if, mm -hmm. let's put it that way, which is, I mean, it's like when Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. What is the, the interesting thing is the response of his apostles. They look at him and say, well, then who can be saved? Yeah. Now, that's an interesting thing. If rich people can't be saved, then who can be saved? That yeah. shows that their mindset was, if you're rich, that means God has blessed you. Yes. That's right. That's a sign of divine blessing. And if you're poor, if some shits happen to you, that's a sign that God has not blessed you and you're cursed. I mean, it goes back to the book of Job. Absolutely. Now, there's there's a strain of that in modern Catholic traditionalism as well with the Christ, the King and integralism stuff. All right. That, it, you know, the church is a perfect society that God is invested with all of these, you know, all of this authority and therefore is a sign of Christ's kingship, the church needs to rule supreme over the whole world. But as as John Betts points out in a great article in the New Resource Month called The Analogy of Tradition, he goes, that same St. Paul says 
that Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but took the form of a slave. And Beth says, uh, uh, contra the traditionalists, the integralists, uh, okay, if we're going to imitate Christ the King, maybe we should divest ourselves of all of these kinds of trappings of, you know, uh, when have we taken on the form of a slave? When have we, you know, given up our, our, our sort of prerogatives and so on. But anyway, once again, I'm ranting and raving. Go ahead, Rodney. No, no, you're, that's exactly the point that, that you're making the point uh, uh, so well. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, to, to think about that, it, Yeah, I mean, so so I, th I think you see this to some degree in the synod, where what you're trying to do is you're trying to spread the 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 authority of the church around, so to speak, right? So that everybody apparently has. So, so it's it's very much that idea that the church would be better if it's more democratic or, or whatever. Of course, again, that that's 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 wrong for so many reasons because the majority is often wrong. I mean, there's no there's no yeah. assurance that just because you spread. Yeah the voices you're going to get more yeah uh you know you're going to get more truth for instance but you know it's it's such it's, it's precisely that though nobody's talking about the truth everybody's talking about hearing voices okay but what if the voices are false yeah i mean how do we discern truth from false voices right what's and, in and the first letter of john for many false prophets have gone into the world yes precisely right and so this is exactly why Christ had to invest authority into some people that was a distinct kind of authority that, again, is safeguarded by a charism so that these people are under the authority of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's interesting at the end of the, the Jerusalem Council, uh, when James or, or Peter stood up and said, we and the Holy Spirit have decided <laughs> um, it, it's yeah. a very, you know, right. I mean, they're very much like, Hey, this is, this is, this is us. The Holy spirit was part of this thing. Right. And we're trying to be docile to that. Or even I don't like, mean to interrupt, but this goes back to what I was talking about. The, the, the importance of the Holy spirit in the early church, when they chose the apostle to replace, uh, you know, Judas and they chose Matthias, right. It's, yes. it, it was very much almost a kind of magical thing. You know, it's like, they're pulling lots. yeah, they're yeah. Doing, yeah, pulling, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's throw some saying. dice. Well, yeah, the Holy Patrick. Spirit will show us by we'll, if it's a seven, we'll, we'll, yeah, whatever. Anyway, go ahead. Which is their way of saying we're incompetent to decide who should be yeah, the next person. That's right? Right. Yeah. But that, it seems, so it yeah. seems to me the first, the first step in becoming somebody with authority in the church is to kind of admit that you're a nincompoop, right? It, it, and it seems to me it's, it's very important almost that the 12 don't get Jesus. They are the, like the ones who almost understand the least in the Gospels, right? I mean, it's, they're constantly, yeah. it, Peter, no, you won't have to be crucified. That's absurd. Messiahs don't get crucified. You know, they, they crucify. Yeah. They don't get crucified, right? You know, and all that. It's, and it's, and it's, let's go back to the woman. Thing. And, why, and why was Peter packing heat at the Last Supper? Right. I mean, seriously, yeah. right? I mean, I, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's got that sword with him. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, which he uses. Yeah, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Go back to the women thing you said. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's funny. It's it's the women already get it, kind of right. I mean, who's with them at the cross? It's not the men. You know, the 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 yeah. uh, the apostles have all fled to the four winds because they all have a conception of the kingdom that n did not expect this to happen. The only John remains at the foot of the John, cross, and he's also he's the contemplative one. That's exactly right. And so we can draw on Baltazar here and say the Marian church was at the foot of the cross. Yeah. The Johine or the contemplative church was at the foot of the cross, but the institutional church had fled, right? <laughs> yeah, run right? away, run yeah. away. <laughs> All the more reason why they need a special gift to do what they do is precisely because they don't kind of get it, right? They, they're not simpatico with it. They need a charism to keep them under control. Um, it's so why would women want to become a part of something like that in that in that competitive way? Like, hey, the men get all the fun, you know, Mary's yeah. not looking for that kind of authority in, in the in the early church. She's too busy holding up a, a, an example of what it means to be a Christian. And just one final point on that, then, is it's so interesting that we need to empower women in the church. The greatest woman ever in the church, Mary, said God raises up the lowly and brings down the power. So yeah. why do we want to empower women if God, you know, tears down the powerful? Well, let's let's delve into this theologically yeah. because I think this yeah. is interesting. 
yeah. uh, about some possibility. First off, I think uh, the reason why they're concerned about empowerment, let me back up a second. I wrote at one, in one of my synod diaries where I said, with regard to the synod, uh, the progressive wing of the church doesn't really care about synodal processes. I guarantee you once they get their way, if they get their way, all synodality will end. And if Pope Francis came out tomorrow in a mode appropriate and said, we're going to have women priests, we're going to have gay blessings, blah, 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 blah. They would immediately do away with all synodal discussions and conversations. Right. So in other words, the reason why they are seeking empowerment is because they want their point of view ensconced in church doctrine. This, so this is about, ultimately, this is about changing church doctrines to reflect this secular worldview that your article is is about. That's what's at stake here. And I wish we would just cut the BS and cut to the chase. What we're arguing about here are these hot button issues where the liberals want to change your, it, it's, it's not about synodality, but then the other thing, and, and you can comment on that, but then we can comment on this other thing, which is uh, you, you mentioned earlier about one of the goals is the democratization of the church, all these voices. How do we discern the voices? I dis, I have written, and I think it's, it's true that theologically a more among the more sophisticated proponents of, of this uh, sort of progressive view. There is a sort of runaway Ronarian vision of an always already engraced world in play here. Mm -hmm. uh, that revelation as such is not in a sense simply the, uh, the, the provenance of the magisterium to unpack in yeah. these like single focal points uh, that in reality, the Holy Spirit is in fact unpacking revelation within the transcendental structures of every single human soul on the planet. Now, there's some sense in which I would agree with that. That is true. But the, when that gets radicalized, you end up with a world that is so always already engraced and revelatory that it's almost a, a, a Hegelian bubbling up from below of some sort of world. It's not that they're saying all opinions are equal. It's that they, they want to discern a kind of geist, a kind of historical dynamic, the, the curve of history bends towards justice and so on, all this kind of stuff. And they want to locate that within the broad. And you see this in a certain globalist tendency, in the, even in the church today, to view as more fundamental this, this geist of the world than the geist of the Holy Spirit. Anyway. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, that's so, so I, I, I mean, I obviously couldn't say that any better. So in other words, it seems to me there's kind of a double movement going on. There's one, there's a kind of cynicism towards the notion that a bunch of males could actually give us contact with the word of God. Yes. Right. Right. Could actually, you know, so, so obviously because they're males, their their partial their view of things is partial, um, and they're self interested and all this stuff. And the only way to balance that out is to get some self interested women in there to speak of the <laughs> right to speak of the interests yeah. of women, and then you know it's a, and other marginalized voices. They, you know, I'm sure the LGBT community, et cetera, et cetera, right. Um, so that's a cynicism towards the notion that the spirit works is able to work through sinful and i don't want to paint a rosy picture of bishops and priests and, and popes I'm, i'll be the least of you. all i'm saying is that we as catholics do believe that at the end of the day god has spoken successfully his voice has been heard through fallen human beings like peter paul yes you know, pope pius this pope john that you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's a cynicism towards that at the same time the thing you're talking about is a sort of implicit notion that the way the West happens to be going in its leftist trajectory, let's make clear, right, yeah. is the movement of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that that becomes the test by which we judge church doctrine, right? It cannot be, according to this canon of thought, that women can be excluded from the priesthood. Obviously, that's absurd. Because yeah. Western secular modernity has right. insisted on the absolute equality of, of, of men and women, right? So it has to be that we're we're behind, we're not with the arc of history, as you're calling it, right? So right. now the church right. has to be judged in the light of this, 
or the light of, you know, and it obviously can't be the case that we deny the right of two men to be married or the right, you know, et cetera, or yeah. the right of people to yeah. pick the gender or any of those things. Or of a 13 year old boy to have his pee pee cut off. You got it. That all, <laughs> yeah. That's exactly it. It's all of right. that stuff is to precisely be out of step with the spirit and what, how do we know what the Spirit's doing? Well, where is secular Western modernity going? It just seems to me that's the answer, right? Which is yeah. why, and this is a kind of a final point, th th this is why like those, co that, those comments that Radcliffe made about the African bishops or maybe didn't make, or who knows, it's all big mystery. He made them. They he just had them. to backtrack because he's an idiot. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I mean, think about that. It's, it's not even that the Holy Spirit is moving in the world today and we need to listen to where, how the Spirit... No, the Holy Spirit is precisely moving in the West. That's right. In the <laughs> liberal not, leftist, in the yeah. leftist West. Yeah. In the left West. That's where the Holy Spirit right. is. It's well, you see... Like, yeah, none of these ahead. people would say the Holy Spirit's moving in the, in the, in the uh, presidential campaign of Donald Trump. No, yeah, There's never, no danger never. of that, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, I want to be clear about it. I mean, let's let's delve a little bit into the analogy with politics here, because there, yes. in, in order to highlight this curve of history, this arc of history yeah. is always bending towards leftism uh, yes. r rather than more paleo conservative or conservative, whatever you want to call it, values. Yeah. Uh, say to the paleo anarchism of a Dorothy Day or something like that. No, no, it's it's trending leftist, statist, all that sort of stuff. But what one of the things that's interesting to me is is you the 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 psychological reaction that and 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 then the descriptors that are used whenever you see a, a right of center political party say in europe gain ascendancy in in the election parliamentary elections they're always described as far right yes far right People, you know, like Meloni in Italy was a far right, you know, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, well, are they far right? If they were running in the United States, they would be just centrists, uh, maybe even left of center, but they're far right. Then and, and, and then the reaction against them is visceral. You yeah. even in the in the German church, you have bishops now saying, I mean, you, you can be a politician in favor of aborting children and you can go to communion. But the German bishops are now saying, if you're a member, I can't remember what political party it is, yeah. but it's a far right political party, according yeah. to them. And you can't be a Catholic and be a part of this party. Now, Germany might be a special case because of national socialism sure. or whatever. But you get my point. Now, yep. go to the United States. I, I loathe and despise Donald Trump, and I will not vote for him. I'm not voting for Harris either. I, I, I a pox on both their houses. Yes, I'm one of those guys. All right. Save your emails. I'm not going to answer them. All right. I, I loathe and despise Donald Trump, who is a clown act. Uh, and and the fact of the matter, though, is I do get a certain satisfaction out of the fact that he annoys people that I also I, I, I loathe even more. <laughs> uh, and and the point being that you you and towards Elon Musk as well and free speech you see people like Hillary Clinton and others saying well we get, we have to stop free speech we've got to put the kibosh and all this it's almost as if well we've had they have a sense of entitlement that history is curving towards us and now all of a sudden this jerk Donald Trump has entered into the uh, Elon Musk is in and we're no longer in control of the narrative like we thought we were my point is that the outrage meter, all of this Hitler, he's Hitler, he's a fascist. Well, no, no, he's actually not. You know, he's too incompetent to be Hitler, uh, <laughs> you know, even if he wanted to be. That's yeah. my view. Once again, don't send me hate mail. That's my view. But you get my point then. You yeah. see this as well then in the church, like the Germans or the Dutch or whatever. We must have women priests. Don't you understand? Don't you understand? We have gay blessings. Otherwise, our church will have no relevance in our society anymore. Well, maybe it shouldn't. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no, that, that, that's good. And I mean, so it's, it's, it's as Del Noche says, we both are big fans of Augusto Del Noche. Yeah. He says that they're, 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 the problem is there's only a fear of fascism, right? And, and we should fear fascism, obviously. But there's always errors on both sides. And this is, to your point, we never, ever hear the media have an outcry about somebody who's far left. That's right. I no, mean, they're a, never even described as far left. There ever. is a communist party in Italy. Right. I mean, it's a it's a vocal and a fairly large yeah. communist party. I mean, when I was living there, 
routinely the communist party would be going down the street with their flags and their sickle and the whole bit right yeah and yeah. just thinking wow here's a communist party which i actually kind of found amusing and almost refreshing at least we have the full spectrum of the political things and and all this stuff and all that but take a bolshevist out for coffee yeah <laughs> You know, where's the media outcry over the far left, given the fact that far left regimes have done horrific things? Uh, I mean, yeah. Stalin was responsible for the death of 50 million people, right? I mean, Solzhenitsyn exposes this in his gulag, which nobody wants to talk about, right? Because we only have this error on one side. And that's 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 just that's always bad when you only have an error on one side. There's nothing to keep you. Off and off. they were able to say. Well, the communists are not far left like that because we now have tamed the Marxist movement and domesticated it to Italian values, not Stalinist values. So you Gramsci and others like this, uh, you know, so that. But the point is, why is that same courtesy never granted to more conservative political parties for right. saying, OK, yeah, we're conservative, we're right wing, but we're not fascist. We're not right. Hitler, just right. as you communists are not Stalin. We're not Hitler. All right. right? But that right. courtesy is never granted. Right. No, absolutely. So so there's a there's an obvious imbalance, all which kind of takes us back to the point that, that I one of the points I'm trying to make in the article is. Recovering the. Catholic social doctrine, you know, from Leo the Thirteenth on, especially kind of learning the the Thomistic roots of it, I think is a really important thing right now. There is a kind of broadly what I would call a Thomistic political philosophy, which is which is very very of course like his regular philosophy tied up to his Christ, to his Catholicism. It's distinctively Catholic. So yeah. I, you and I both agree that there are, can be a distinctively Christian philosophy. I also believe that there can be a distinctively Christian take on the political. I think Catholic social doctrine articulates that to some degree. I think G.K. Chesterton does, uh, you know, Dorothy Day and Peter Mar Peter Marum was very much yeah. into Chesterton, you know, uh, and, and and also those movements in, in, in France that were that were kind of, you know, almost like broadly Christian socialist parties and things like that. It's not that I'm looking for a Catholic party that I can vote for. No. What I'm saying no. is before we even worry about that, we've got to begin to think as Catholics again, which means we have to embrace that weird transvaluation transvaluation of values that is Catholicism. You know and what will yeah, what will be a Catholic political party is any political party that has a lot of genuine Catholics in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, my point, one absolutely. could be a Republican yeah. or a Democrat or a social Democrat or whatever, or a solidarity, party, a green party. If you're a devout and faithful Catholic, there's going to be a way in which you create in, a, in an act of creativity that cannot be adjudicated in advance and spelled out as a program. You are going to be the inventor of that program as you apply your Catholic vision to whatever political need at hand. You get you get my point? Absolutely. And so I think a, a really important principle here is a false secularization of the political. And, and what yes. I mean by that is a is a tendency to keep our politics hermetically sealed from our theology so that our theology hasn't transformed from within some of the things. So so, for instance, especially with progressive, this happens, but it happens with conservative Catholics also. Um there's just an assumption of a certain morality, which then they they enlist the faith to defend that morality. So this this idea that we all have to be equal, right? Um, it's really interesting. Like equality, yeah. I understand that. Obviously, I believe in the equal dignity of all human beings. You know, yeah. sort of race, sex, what I don't care about any of that. But this obsession with absolute equality, equality of role, you know, et cetera, et cetera, is just simply not a value that you find in the tradition. Again, you quoted it. Jesus is commended for not counting equality with the father, a thing to be so grasped after. That. That's right. Eve is condemned for grasping after equality with the father, right? I mean, it's this grasping after total equality is, is diabolical. That's what the devil wants worship. He wants to be, wor he wants to be equal to God. That's the that's the causes the fall of the devil causes the fall of Eve. So maybe we ought to question this absolute value on equality that you find in liberal regimes or again, freedom. 
this this notion that I have a right to do my thing and nobody can tell me what to do. And again, you get it on both sides of the aisle with guns or or contraception or whatever the issue is. This demand for absolute freedom, individual freedom, simply has no basis in the Catholic tradition. It's no, libertarian it nonsense. It, it's not it's not Catholic. Yeah, I mean, I, we interviewed James Kelb and he sort of, you know, Yes. has made that point in his books over and over that it's this idolatry of equality of radical equality and it is all a subset i'm so glad you've identified this rodney and you've repeated it over and over both in your article and and here today this 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 obsession with a certain concept of power is yes. precisely what drives this obsession with a certain misbegotten notion of equality as well because notice at the same time how often leftists love to speak of pluralism and inclusion. And isn't it ironic how often the pluralism and inclusion and diversity of which they speak is a monochrome, homogenized yeah. pablum yeah. Uh, of where differences are actually erased? Isn't, isn't that the point of DEI? At the end of the day, you have all of this affirmative action for various marginalized groups precisely in order to erase distinctions. Uh, but of, of all kinds, gender distinctions, mm -hmm. sex distinctions. So it, it is a crazy kind of pluralism that seeks the end of all natural divisions within society. That's right. That's right. That, that, that's exactly what it does. Right. So you so so the, the differences um, get obliterated in a strange way uh, that you wouldn't think that anybody should really want. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you if you're if you're if you're a feminist in the in the true sense of the word, you want to defend the feminine. Right. You, you, it seems to me that's what feminism ought to be about is defending the feminine, which is what I think JP, two does in his in his letter on women, which is, I think, really good. But again, it's it's it, it kind of um, goes back to that kind of turning values on their head a little bit and beginning to think in think of the world through a Christian lens rather than adding Christian sprinkles on to an already established ethic, which I think, again, both sides do that to, to some degree. They already come into the thing saying, well, the economy has nothing to do with theology. Why is the church speaking on the economy? The economy is this independent, neutral, you know, yeah, yeah. Right? It, it, no, <laughs> it wasn't in the Middle Ages, <laughs> right? Usury was condemned for a reason because e yeah. economics is not theologically neutral, right? Or morally That's neutral. Right. That's right. right. Yeah. So just a recovery of that sense, I think, is, is really important. But just kind of one final point. I was I was I was trying to think of what I was meaning in, in particular. Um, thinking about power, right. Even at the level of God, because God is obviously om, omnipotent. It's one of our names for God, you know, in classical theism. But it's interesting how God wields his power. Right. Because the way God wields his power is actually to give the gift of being to all things, right? And then even to invest a certain freedom in creation, which gives freedom space to kind of be itself and to do these things. That's right. Yeah. Which is precisely what God does with his power is to actually help beings flourish as the sort of beings they are. That's what, so he's a, he has a generous power. So that if you think about power in that way, then it kind of takes that nasty side out of it, that desire to dominate the other. And I think of like a good mom or a good dad. They're not yeah. out to limit there their children. Go. They're out to liberate what's great about their children. Now they use their authority and the power to curb the things in their kids that are going to be bad for them, right? If you yeah. see you're getting addicted to drugs, you'd be like, no, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So you use your authority, your power. Um, Aquinas says, God doesn't forbid anything of us unless it's bad for us, All right? So God does use his authority to say, you can't do that because doing yeah. it is going to be bad for you, right? So if, if we think of it that way, like even from God all the way down, even God doesn't wield his power for his own self-interest. And that's what was troubling to me about that synodal thing about empowering women. It was almost what they were saying is we need to give them power so they can defend their interests, just like men now get to defend their interests. That's right. That's Nobody right. Nobody should be defending their own interests. In fact, in point of fact, let's let's stand this on its head, because yeah. if it is in fact true 
that yes. the nature of power in the Catholic Church is that you have a bunch of celibate men who are simply defending their own interests, yeah. then that is what needs to be attacked. And yes. you're not going to attack it by simply adding another class of self-interested people to, in a sense, neutralize the first class of self-interested people. This is a, this is not Christian at no, all. It's liberal. May, and this is John Betz's point exactly in this article, the analogy of tradition. His point is the church needs to divest itself of precisely this kind of power that you're talking about, Rodney, yep. the power of the secular notions of self-interest, yes. uh, what we would call clericalism. That's that's the essence of clericalism, the yep. institutionalization, if you will, of clerical self-interest, in this case, male clerical self-interest. Uh, and so there, there has to be, if you want, once again, frustration, if there's going to be, if, if you look in the history of the church, all the greatest reform movements in the history of the church have begun with the fire lit by the charism of a particular saint yes. or, or uh, uh, yeah. in other words but by, by sanctity i like to say i wrote an article once what we need is a discalced laity uh or a, a discalced church you know all these religious orders you know we're we're we, we, we're shoeless. <laughs> yeah. We're the shoeless ones. That yeah. means we're more radical. But you get my point. This yeah, yeah, yeah. this is insane. This tack that we're now taking. No, it is. And it's, it's, it's again, if you think about it again in these Baltazarian terms, I think are super helpful. The Petrine dimension of the church, you know, the 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 the, the teaching authority, the uh, you know, et cetera, the institutional dimension, is precisely there to defend what they know is best, which is the Mary. The institutional church is about defending the possibility of sanctity and nothing they can teach should undermine that, that the possibility of somebody being a saint. And it seems to me, actually, it, 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 if any bishops are guilty of, of, of amassing power the, to themselves in order to get their way, that seems to me to be, the, I'm sorry, the progressive bishops. John Paul II, yeah. when he was asked about women's ordination, yeah. he literally said, I don't have the authority to ordain women, even if I wanted to. Yeah. Because he has to be docile to the teaching of the church, right? He's not, the, right. He's, he doesn't have any power over scripture and tradition. His, his power is to preserve. Well, let's put a fine, let's put a fine point on your argument. And neither yeah. one of us are necessarily big fans of Pope Francis. Let's be blunt. Right. Yeah. And yet uh, here's Pope Francis, who probably really does want to ordain women. But even he says, no, can't do it. Exactly. And that's when, when push comes to shove, I have to give the guy credit. Every every yeah. one of the big hot button issues, when push comes to shove, he says, nope, can't do it. <laughs> It can't be less sin. I mean, my know, problem with Pope Francis is that he raises expectations. As I yes. said in my last piece in First Things, he like the synod provoked and then retreats. This is what Pope Francis he provokes. Let's have another commission and women deacons. And then yeah. he says to Nora O'Donnell, no. <laughs> when she asks about women priests, no. He leans for no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay. Well, which is it? You know, crazy, crazy. I think he somehow thinks it's helpful to say it that he at least is listening to these people's concerns. But again, it, it, once you've settled a matter of, of doctrine in a, in a kind of definitive way, what, how does it help to keep talking? Do we kill, keep, keep to say, is Jesus Christ a creature? You know, yeah, let, let's yeah. keep talking about that. <laughs> like, no, I, I, I think that uh, in, in some ways it, in order to understand Pope Francis, we have, I think to understand that he might actually have some erroneous pictures in his head. And yep. what I mean by that is he seems, though, though orthodox in yeah. his theology, he seems to have a particular belief that conservative Catholics are in control of the church mm -hmm. and, that, and that they've mucked it up mm -hmm. and that it's a problem. And he, yeah. in other words, he really doesn't. He seems to have this still this 1950s mentality that the, the church is overrun with all these finger whacking you know, yeah. moralizing concern. Where is that church? You know, uh, yeah. I, and, and he really hates it. And so I think well, what explains why he would promote a Bishop McElroy to Cardinals, yes. uh, even yeah. though he doesn't agree with him on X, Y, Z. It's right. because he really loathes the right. He does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's true. And I also think that he might buy into the narrative that the left had been silenced under the papacies of J.B. Yeah. and Rotzinger. Yeah. So now we yeah. got to let them talk again. Um, yeah, that, again, it's just, that's unfortunately, that's just sociology. Like that's, It's that's, trite. It's just so trite. 
It is. That's again one of the reasons I, I I wrote this piece was to just just say something very simple. We need to think theologically again, <laughs> and not frame everything in terms of please. Left right. Yeah, make theology great again. Yeah, seriously. If right? I can make a hat of Matuga, I <laughs> make yeah, theology yeah. MTGA Matuga. Yeah, uh, yeah. Make, get a nice big blue hat, blue for Mary. We, yeah, we and and then you and you know it's it's so interesting. You and I have been doing this series on Vatican II, really digging in the weeds in these documents. And man, these guys were parsing words, and they were words, and and really intense and really good theological debates about we can't use this word because of this, and we have to use this word instead, and all these things. And here, the, it seems like so much of the the language coming out of the Senate is so loosey goosey and so imprecise and so like empower women. Like that's just not our language. I'm sorry. That's, that's it's it's the language of the boardroom. It's the it's language yeah. drawn from marketing firms and corporatism and yes. and 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 human resource departments. I mean, seriously, yeah. uh, even the artwork is this sort oh. of bizarre kind Have of. Have you seen this little anime doll? Yeah, <laughs> I swear I wasn't going to comment on that. I mean, for crying out loud, you, a, Babylon, a, a Babylon B parody could not have been funnier than. It, but than it does this. say something like it's it's it, it, it's like a symbol of this of the kind of the silly like we've so degenerated to the level of like the pop culture that we're yeah. this, is, this is our symbol. And then the language we use, it sounds like I would have had the infant of Prague with a hand grenade in his hand, you know. <laughs> It's the symbol of the holy or whatever. <laughs> Catholic Chucky, Catholic yeah. Chucky, you know, uh, that's, that's that. I, you, in other words, seriously, uh, somebody referred to it as Sacra Pop, S A C R dash P O P, Sacra Pop. Right. Uh, you know, and and if, if we're going to go the route of Sacra Pop culture, let's right. let's at least do something that's hysterically funny, you know, yeah. like Catholic Chucky or something like that. Uh, anyway, I, I, I joke, uh, you know, here we are in possession of the, the Vatican's in possession of some of the greatest artworks yeah. that ever produced by human hands. Yeah. <laughs> we come up with little anime dolls as the next thing for the synod. Right. Um, I want to just go one step further, you know, so just to kind of at the end of my article and get your just your perspective on this is is that it seems to me by looking at what's going on in the broader culture more and more people and not just christians in fact many many non-christians um seem to be tiring of the liberal experiment and the enlightenment experiment and, yeah. you, and we've talked about people like ian mcgilchrist john Berveke. It's a, and, and people, and there's tons of them now, like uh, Jonathan Peugeot, he's actually an Orthodox Christian. Um, they interview a lot of people and talk to a lot of people out there who are experimenting in all sorts of weird stuff. But what they all have in common is they all say, we've had way, way, way too much enlightenment. Like the values of the enlightenment, yeah. have been, we've, we've been going down that path in such an extreme way that we've forgotten all these other values and people are depressed and anxious and there's all sorts of bad fallout. The environment, we're really destroying the environment. I mean, like crazy, right? Um, because, and again, this is all industrial capitalist values. Why are we destroying Because we have no restraint whatsoever. We, you know, we're, we're consumers, yeah. the whole bit, right? Um, and then increased violence and all these things. And everybody seems to be seeking for something. And Vareka has this great series on YouTube. I think it's like 55 videos where he goes through like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Confucius, the Buddha. He just gets marches through just like looking at all these great figures of history and saying, what can we learn? Like, what do we need to learn from these people? And then here's the church saying, let's imitate the, the very yeah. thing that even yeah. the people out there are getting sick of. We're like, no, yeah. we need to be more like that. This is where I think... This is the end of my article. I say we have to like be the people that go back into the cave, having seen the light, and let them know that they're living in a in a cave. Because I really do think liberalism is this bubble that people live in that they can't think outside of, and they're trapped in it. And so all of our solutions to our problems are just more liberalism. 
Like if, oh, we've yeah, created yeah. a big environmental catastrophe. So let's use more technology to invent another technology that will, you know. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. Like the big windmills, uh, the yeah, like, you know, and yeah, yeah. oh, we, we're going to put them all offshore. Uh, now yeah. there was uh, just a couple months ago, one of them disintegrated and spread deadly fiberglass fibers all over some beach that had to be shut down and so on. How could we have seen that coming? <laughs> you can't recycle those things and no one knows how to get rid of the darn things in there and they do break all the time and then of course what's the yeah. carbon footprint it takes to actually even make the damn things right. but likewise with car but what are you going to do with the 18 trillion old car batteries yeah uh can you really recycle all that stuff how are right. we going to mine all the lithium oh we just discovered lithium in arkansas true story yeah. You know, yeah. oh, let's dig up Arkansas now so yeah. we can have lithium so we don't put carbon. You get my point. You're, you're yes. at, my point is, I yeah. agree with you, 10 million percent. Uh, we keep doubling down on yeah. technology as the answer to the fact that our technology has destroyed the environment. Exactly. You know, here's and an that, idea. Yeah. Outlaw plastic and see how fast we clean things up. There's plastic in our brains. There's plastic everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. You know, it, it, plastic is deadly. We have to start thinking of it in those terms. Plastic is deadly. It so is. let's let's cut instead of carbon. Why don't we cut back our plastic use? Ninety five percent can't have that because corporate America would. That's right. It's not assassinate any president that did that. Let's That's just put exactly. it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the point is, I think that we're liberalism has kind of gone so far. It's becoming self-destructive. So the last thing we need to do as Christians is to imitate it. The, the thing we need to yeah. do is to rediscover our values which have always been very critical of capitalism on the one hand uh, in various kinds of, uh, uh, you know, destroying the family on the other. I mean, it's, it, you know, Catholic social doctrine is conservative and liberal at the same time in the exact opposite ways that our parties are conservative. Like they're conservative in all the wrong ways and liberal in all the wrong ways. Catholic social doctrine is liberal in all the right ways and conservative. In all well, that's the problem with the coming together of the, uh, I see it really kind of began with Bill Clinton with the coming together yeah, the new uh, of the, of, of the Una party uh, yeah. on, on all these sorts of things, because, yeah. you know, it used to be Republicans were concerned with your wallet and Democrats were concerned with your private bits, your naughty yeah. bits. Yep. And now they're both concerned with, you know, with both, both of those things, you know, and that's what yeah. none it's of it squares libertarianism on both sides. And, the, and whoever is more libertarian wins. It's so interesting yeah. if you watch the campaigns and this is a this is something that Plato warns about in democratic regimes. He says you have to pander to the lowest common denominator in order to get elected. That's how democracy yeah, works. Yeah, it is if how you it watch works. the campaigns, um, Harris has to cater to the grossest part of the left, which is, oh my gosh, if we don't have abortion, we can't have sex anytime we want without consequences. So she That's has right. all these horror stories about Trump's going to end abortion. And then Trump has to pander to the worst part of the right, which is xenophobia and all that creepy stuff. And both of them have to pander to the lowest elements of their party in order to try to get elected. It's just so disturbing. Yes, yes. Well, and it goes, Rodney, to your point, too, about self-interest. Yeah. The fact is uh, th there are, you know, apologists for uh, modern style democracy out there who, who understand. Yeah, you're right. We have to pander to the lowest common denominator and the most uneducated person's vote counts just as much as the most wise yeah. and edu but they would say that's okay because what voting really is about is voting self-interest wow it's not about it's not about the yeah. wisest people deciding yeah. who's going to run our country it's about getting 330 million people to <laughs> vote in their own self-interest and the idea is that at, hopefully it's at least an enlightened self-interest in some sense yeah. where you realize that the good of my neighbor ultimately redounds back on my good so it can't yeah. just be dog eat dog is you know so okay i'll yeah. vote for welfare or whatever but the point being going to right to the heart of your article here that it's still an entire governmental system predicated on self-interest and, right. and that every th that somehow or another it's like ayn rand on steroids mm -hmm. self-interest will uh, uh, competing self-interest will create yeah the moral good yeah and and that's what i think every that's what people are more and more people are learning that it just doesn't work we we, we told that lie at the beginning right. of the we've, right. we've been we've been trying it out and i think the reason it hasn't it's now coming to an end is because for the first 
200 years practically of modernity, we were still very much living under the auspices of Christian values. We were basking in the afterglow of- Yeah, we were, we were. And the farther we get from those values, the, the uglier liberalism gets. And both parties get worse at what they're bad at. You know, the, the capitalists get more unbridled capitalist and the libertarian sexual yeah. freak get more, you know, and it just keeps getting, it's just, it just gets worse and worse. And now I think we're beginning, we should begin to see that this is not going to end well if we just keep going down this path. But the one point that, that we made just a little bit ago that I think is important with this is the one place where it's obvious that enlightened self-interest hasn't worked is the environment. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, it, it, it literally it's it, there's no way that enlightened self-interest is going to get this thing turned around. That's why you had John Kerry say we need to essentially try to find a way around the First Amendment so that we can work on global warming, because the First Amendment and free speech is just really screwing things up here. <laughs> yeah, it's it's because it, it is one of those things where it is a common good that is not reducible to the selfish interest of any you know, maybe my self-interest in not having my wallet stolen helps me put up with a police force, which is a common good. But it, it, there's 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 so yeah. many. The other thing, I mean, so the environment is is hasn't been helped by that at all. But the other thing too is just the, the traditional family, yeah. because you a family is by definition they have to be selfless to have a good family. Yeah. It, the more selfish a family is, the worse the family. You know, you you have to have selflessness in a family for it to work. And so now you're just reversing the whole values of the culture to try. And now, the, of course, the family falls, falls apart. Well, and of course, then this brings up, politically speaking, the question of, OK, what are our alternatives? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I personally consider, I mean, I don't want to let's just put it this way. Uh, there are people like Winston Churchill, who is actually a horrible human being. But, but Winston Churchill, you know, would say, yeah, the, all forms of government are bad, but democracy is the sort of least bad of, of all of them, that kind right. of thing. Yeah. But so the question that often comes up then is the default position is, well, what's your answer then, Mr. Smarty Pants? If modern liberal democracy is predicated upon self-interest, if voting is essentially the institutionalization of self-interest, if our concept of rights is the absolutization of my own private self-interest in a competing Hobbesian way of, of you know, the war of all against all, Great. We get that. And you're right, Rodney. This is accounts for the popularity of the Jordan Petersons of the world and so forth. There's an exhaustion as people recognize. Yes, that's all true. But what are we going to do about it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. You know, you can't just you, you, you run the risk of ending up with a demagogue uh, and and saying, I'm going to I'm going to come in and, 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 and I'm going to be. I'm going to be this this savior figure of some kind. Yeah, it seems to me that at the very least, and uh, when you were in Rome, we had a communio study circle where we read the um, actually we read an article from New Polity about Plato, uh, Plato's Republic. Yeah. Um, I forget to get that. a guy's name is Alex something or other that wrote it. It's a very good article. But his point at the end is that if you take the Republic, literally, it's kind of gets absurd, of course, because you have a communism of women and children and, you know, the the, the uh, guardians get any woman they want. You know, that's their reward for being guardians. And and then the children are everybody's children and kind of all this stuff. Most people realize that Plato is being ironic and he doesn't really recommend this. But this the question this guy asks is, where is Socrates in the Republic? Because Socrates in his real life does not become a philosopher king. He, he becomes a martyr and he becomes a martyr out of piety for the good. He has a piety towards the good that won't let him sell his soul to the devil in order to gain political influence or power. And Jesus, in some sense, is, of course, the same way. Jesus doesn't do anything to gain power over the Roman system in order to fix it politically, so to speak. Both of these guys instead, by precisely not living according to the rules of the cave um, end up pointing a way out. And, and it seems to me that the way Christianity mitigated the evils of the Roman Empire was by just converting people to Christianity. I mean, it sounds silly, but I, I really don't think there's much better thing that we could do as Catholics is to be Catholic and to 
invite people to this beautiful thing that is Catholicism. And as liberalism burns itself out, like all horrible regimes do eventually, people yeah. start jumping ship. I mean, at the how, yeah. you know the Roman Empire is falling. What do we let's become Christian there because they're the ones who actually help their their poor and their sick, and we don't, you know, or they're they're the ones that don't have blood in circuses. We do, you know. So um, again, it just it it sounds like a, a kind of a, a a cheap way out, but I think if we don't provide a counterculture, a counter, if we can't be salt and light in some really profound sense because we're compromising because we have to fit into one of these political parties. We're going to go down with the with the with the ship. Um, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yep, absolutely. And that's why it's really dangerous to tie to hitch the ecclesia wagon to any particular, yeah, uh, modern political regime or ideology or party of any kind because they're all so deeply flawed. And well, I really, uh, just one final point then about that is I, I you know this idea that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the rest I, again i think you have to think of it in terms of classical liberalism i don't know that classical liberalism is is worse except for all the rest i think it might be as bad as about any um and, and i yeah. really and i think that so many yeah. american bishops are so americanist they just it's it's they can't even think of the possibility of us giving up on america you know, which is why they're always trying to get us to vote in all this stuff. And I really yeah. almost think the best thing a Catholic could do this election is to literally make public the fact that they refuse to vote for either of these horrible jerks yeah. who are both yeah. evil in so many ways. I mean, you oh. know, yeah, oh, that's that's what I've done. It we're could both be a powerful gonna... statement, a witness that we're, we're not part of it. We refuse to be a part of this, you know, and the hate mail that I get mainly from Catholic Trump supporters, uh, after I say things like this, is testimony to in a backhanded way to exactly the dangers of the things that you're talking about here. It's almost as if they treat Trump as some kind of messiah. And, you know, oh, the babies, the babies, you know, Kamala Harris is going to kill all the babies. Well, Trump, you know, yeah, anyway. Yeah. There's, there, we're still going to have abortion even if Trump gets elected. Sorry. After we, I, after a homily the other week at Mass, where the priest was, it, it seemed to me was subtly trying to tell me who to vote for. I walked up to him after Mass and I said, "So, which pro-abortion party am I supposed to vote for?" Exactly. And don't <laughs> take my words as disparaging the pro-life movement. I'm as pro-life as the next. Person. Oh my gosh! Yeah, my parish, my issue. parish has a pro-life pregnancy center that we support. Providence Pregnancy Center, 100 percent. Jim Caviezel was just there for a fundraiser, 100 percent pro-life right here. And yet the Republican Party is, uh, yeah, they got rid of Roe v. Wade, but let's not go down that rabbit hole. The point is, is yeah. that they are not the savior. They are not the savior. They're not pro-life either. Uh, and they're not they're not pro-life. They are made not that very pro-life. clear. Both both candidates, the vice president and the presidential candidate has said, oh, no, we're not yeah. going to touch. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I mean, we could we could talk to the cows come home about the politics of abortion and the Catholic vote. And, uh, but you know, for example, and yeah, let's talk policy. I'm going to, we're, we're that Al Smith dinner that Kamala Harris didn't go to. And tra- what a travesty, what a disgrace that right. that pile of garbage was. I mean, the Al Smith, Al Smith was this, for those who don't know way back in, I think it was the thirties, twenties, Al Smith was a Catholic who one of the first Catholics to run for president, you know, and was, you know, soundly defeated. And there was a lot of anti-Catholic bigotry and so forth. Uh, and, you know, that's why it was such a breakthrough when JFK got it. But there, so the Al Smith dinner has been around for many, many, many decades now. And it used to be a very dignified affair where both candidates came to, to the thing and Democrats and Republicans met. And it was for a fundraiser for Catholic charities. And everybody agreed for one night uh, to, in a sense, engage in fellowship, to allow uh, their basic humanity and their fundamental commonality as Americans to rise above party politics. And yet it has descended now into the comedy club where you're supposed to get up and tell the most vulgar jokes about your opponent to get cheap laughs. Of course, Kamala Harris didn't show up to this one, but even before in years gone by, you know, it's just descended into this gab fest. Uh, and to me, that's and I'm not bring, I don't think this is a side issue. I bring it up because I think it's it's a condensed symbol. The Al Smith dinner of what's wrong right now. What yeah. you brought up the American bishops like, oh, go vote democracy, all this kind of stuff. 
And yet there's that Al Smith dinner, which I think is just an abomination. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, it has to be a point there. There's a, there's some point in history in Europe where there was, I forget even what country it was, but the two parties were so vile that the bishop actually forbade them to vote. <laughs> I have to come up with this. I'll get you. I'll get you the. Oh, facts. we need that. We definitely yeah. need that. But I think that yes. is awesome. It's just, uh, the presupposition, I think, of of the American Catholic is our system is so obviously, you know, uh, above critique that there could never get to the place where we would despair of the whole system. Uh, it's not in principle impossible to despair of the whole system. Again, the the Roman the Roman Empire. I don't think the early apostles were that concerned about you know, who was going to get voted yeah. to the next emperor. That's right. That's right. No, yeah, well, whoever he is, he is. It's going to be we'll bad get, either way. Well, hopefully, hopefully he's a good one, but we could get a, a bad one, and we'll just have to deal with it when it comes. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, and one of the great mythologies of the, that, you know, the, one of the Enlightenment's myth of origins and one of the mythologies to arise is this idea that somehow, some way, if you have democracy, you will not have, uh, yeah, you're, it is true, you won't have a dictator but that you won't have despotism, that you won't have a soft totalitarianism, that right. you won't have egregious abuses of power, because after all, the people get to vote and they would vote out the scoundrels. <laughs> si se puede. Come on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, Aristotle just explicitly disagrees with that. And he thinks that he thinks that democracy actually is the most dangerous kind because the tyranny of the masses is the most dangerous kind of tyranny. Um, it's even more it's even worse than the tyranny of one. So, yes. uh, yeah, and just so to be clear, Rodney and I are not arguing for integralist, monarchist, let's, you know, ancien regime sort of return of, you know, the oh, that kind of thing. We're not advocating for that at all. Uh, and what we are advocating for is yet to be born. That's the thing. That's the point. I, I, I think that's right. And all I would just say again, too, and, and, and people, you know, obviously people are free to vote for the lesser of two evils this time. And sure, and let them vote. I don't care. That do that, that's fine with me. I'm not going to condemn anyone. But if we're, if we're looking at priorities right now as Catholics in this country, our priority is to rediscover our tradition. And, and that means rediscovering our political tradition. There is a Catholic political tradition that deserves a hearing, which I think we've allowed liberal democracy to crowd out. We no longer look yeah. to Thomas Aquinas, Leo the 13th, et cetera, et cetera, to kind of inform us in our politics. We allow our nation to inform us in our politics. And then we find our, we do our theology in church. I think we need to rediscover the Catholic political tradition, which I think there is one. I think it's Augustine, Aquinas, et cetera, et cetera. Well, then, yeah. yeah, go ahead. And then just let that, let that keep us from being sucked into the dysfunctional aspects of classical liberalism that that would oh, be absolutely yeah, yeah. that's why i you know to push one of my favorite people obviously once again dorothy day i mean th she was immersed in the thought of aquinas and augustine and the catholic social teaching and yes. catholic political theory and yeah. her sort of what i like to call paleo conservative paleo anarchist views of politics was not like modern day antifa down with all authority, but a radically Catholic reorienting of power, of yeah. what it means to govern, of what it means to have authority, of what a yeah. government should be. Yeah. You know, that doesn't look anything like the Leviathan of the modern surveillance capitalist state. Exactly. And I would also just uh, another shout out to Chesterton because his. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's interesting in his early career. In, in the early 1900s, he was very political. He came from a liberal family, so he was a big. He was a staunch defender of liberalism in the best sense of the word, uh, making sure the poor aren't being working in factories for 12 hours a day, you know, and things like that. And 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 uh, uh, and he was against uh, colonialism and you know, et cetera, et cetera. But as he got older and wiser, he be, he also began to despair of the two party system. In fact, Hilaire Belloc and and G.K. Chesterton's brother wrote a scathing critique of the two-party system, um, which I think is relevant still to our situation. Oh, that's interesting. I've never read that. Yes, it's it's called, I think it's just literally called the, the two-party system. And and their arguments are so, you read them and you're like, oh my gosh, that totally- Oh, she says today. Yeah, it's because it, it, basically what he says is rich and powerful forces are behind both parties and they're not in the interest of the people. 
and neither party, you know, both parties controlled by rich and power interest, uh, rich and powerful interest groups. I'm like, well, what does that sound like? That sounds like Murica to me. Um, so Chesterton increasingly develops his own sort of Christian approach to politics, which he knows is not practical, but he thinks may have a, a but again, the effect of light and salt in the world. It's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, we could just talk and talk and talk because actually, uh, yes, the rich and powerful control both parties. But as you were saying that, what struck me was, uh, is that not the same as it ever was? I mean, na- show me a nation yeah. in the history of the world yeah, yeah, that yeah. hasn't been dominated by those concerned with the libido dominandi, with the yeah. rich and the powerful. Yeah. Uh, and that what we are about, as Joseph Ratzinger and Balthazar once wrote, Tr- the, the Christian politics is to try and construct a civilization of love, yes. not a civilization dominated by those of power and, and, and wealth. Yep. But how does one construct such a thing? To a certain extent, this is the appeal, the perennial appeal of the Marxist critique, mm-hmm. okay, that classical societies always trend in the direction, since they're hierarchically structured, of placing at the top of the hierarchy those with the power and the and the wealth yeah. and so forth to buy their way to the top of the hierarchy. And so they then have this tremendously powerful allure to a certain kind of idealistic young person in particular. We're going to deconstruct all of that. Mm-hmm. And re- but then what happens, of course, there's just a different class of powerful and wealthy people. <laughs> like animal animal farm, right? Some animals yes. are more equal than others. The Orwellian yeah. vision. Right. So, uh, so what I hear you saying, though, Rodney, I mean, is, is, uh, yeah, we do have some theological and intellectual resources, you know, from yeah. which to draw in order right. to construct a modern Catholic politics that yeah. would ca- that would counteract the uh, this this historic universal trend for the, the for the powerful to control things yeah yeah i, th- I think so and, and it, again it's at, at this stage of the game i think the best it can be is kind of a light and assault have that effect on our on our on the politic political system we have so i think that there's a possibility that it could mitigate some of the worst parts of both of our parties if if it were if yeah if it it. um but there have been times in history where you've had a saint who was a king um, and and you had a pope who was a saint, and and they were oh, yeah yeah. The, I mean, so we, Andrew Willard Jones's book. I mean, it's not that's you know, I was yeah on yeah. on the, you know King Louis. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's I, I don't think it's impossible to have a political regime where even if there's uh you know there's one person who allegedly has the power, as long as his vision is for the good, uh, he can help the you know. I think Willard's thing is kings all the way down. A good king, in some sense, empowers everybody to be kings because of subsidiarity and all that stuff. He's not an all. You know, that, yeah. but just yeah, it's a, a, a personnel is policy, and and the fact is, sanctity is what the church should be about. And gute Leute muss man haben. You have to have good people, uh, and and if you have good Catholic sanctified people in positions of authority. So then there's going to be this trickle down effect and, and there's no magic bullet. There's no structural change that we can engage in, you know, to, to come back to the Marxist thing though. No, we're really running over time, but Augusto del Noche writes about the fact that one, one of the things that we, you notice is, it's, you know, Marxism and, you know, by the way, to American listeners, American listeners oftentimes completely underestimate how important Marxist thought was in European politics in, in the 20th century. Uh, it, it, it was very, very close to gaining almost total political power in Italy and places like that. In you know, in, especially in, in the post-war era. Uh, and so you got Del Noce who was writing about you know, Marxism who comes along and says, well, in, you know, what happened to Marxism was that it got swallowed up by the bourgeois, it, it, you know, that you had this Marxist critique of power and wealth, but then all of a sudden power and wealth gets diffused in this thing called the middle class. And so then Del Noche <laughs> calls it the, the cult of material well-being, the cult yes. of well-being. Yeah, that's right. Right. And that Marxism sort of gets swallowed up in yeah. this bourgeois cult of well-being. But yeah. I would argue, and his argument is, this is what has happened to all of our politics. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, so again, just to, to kind of maybe reiterate the point is, is 
it, 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 we could be really helpful just by thinking and speaking in a different kind of language, different values, um, and not allowing our responsibility to the polis to to crowd out half of our Catholic faith. I mean, I, it's a simple thing, but I just think it's super important. Yeah, um, yeah, there, yeah. there are things about Catholic social doctrine that sound more Republican, and there are things in Catholic do, do, social doctrine that sound more Democrat. And I think we Americans allow ourselves to just ignore the part that corrects that one part that we don't want to hear. And, and that's, we don't need to be there. Um, that's where, that's what we need to fight against. Amen, brother. Amen. I can't, I don't have any disagreement with that. None whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How can I say anything against that? Well, we've been at this now. Okay. For about an hour and 15 minutes. And that's kind of where I like, do you have any last, uh, last comments, insights, brilliant, pithy statements of some kind? No, just the, also the thing that too, is I think that would help to heal the way we dialogue within the church. Cause I think the dialogue with, because we've become so committed to the liberal project, even our dialogue in the church is now framed in those categories. Yeah. So I would like to see almost the opposite. I would like just to start talking like Catholics again, and that's even going to change our politics. What's happening now is yes, we're, our po- we're so committed to the liberal project that our politics is even uh, ruining our theology. Oh, my goodness. You're singing my song now. You know, the universal cult to holiness is, is yes. the key. The sanctity is the key. Uh, Paul Bauman in Commonweal magazine had an article of, uh, of, about politics like a week or so ago. It was a decent article. He wrote he, uh, he mentioned me a lot and most of it was positive, uh, but he chided me. He called me peevish for dismissing uh, the idea that, that the structures mattered more than sanctity. I don't remember what exactly it was, but you know, in other words, he criticized my idea that sanctity and the pursuit of holiness is what the church should primarily be focused on and interested in and yeah. not so much rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic to use a tired cliche. So yeah, but I, I I'm, I'm not going to back down I, that, that I'm going to double down on that over and over. And, Cause you've just nailed it. Hauser. You've just nailed it. If we can, in a sense, reframe our own internal ecclesial conversations in a manner that is not predicated upon the assumptions of modern liberal secularity, yeah. then we can then model something that then can spill out into a different form of civil, civil politics. Yes. And again, the, the, the reason that the Romans began to find the Christians attractive is because the Christians had a better worldview, more beautiful as they yeah. lived out that worldview, it was obvious that it was better. When when Julian the Apostate tries to yeah. turn them back to paganism, he has to imitate Christian virtues in order to try to get people to convert back to paganism. And it's, 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 you know. Absolutely. You know, I, Carrie and I were just in Rome. And one of the things that struck me, and of course, Rome is just littered, as you know, with all these great, both uh, pagan and Christian edifices and tombs and so on. We, Carrie and I went to the church, uh, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, which is near the Pantheon, beautiful church, as yeah. you know, as you know. And therein is on underneath the high altar, the main altar, is the tomb of St. Catherine of Siena, which I'm told is one of the most popular Catholic tourist destinations in the city. And you can go behind her tomb and write on a piece of paper a <laughs> prayer request. And then uh, there's a glass door, you open the door and you place your prayer request on her tomb. And there are literally thousands of these little pieces of paper on her tomb. And I wanted to walk over to the Synod. I took a picture of Carrie putting it. I wanted to walk over to the Synod with that picture yeah, and, yeah. and project it up using the Antichrist PowerPoint uh, and, 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 and say, here in his power. Yeah. In that tomb is power. Yes. Nobody gives a rat's fig what you people are doing in here. Meanwhile, there's thousands of people lined up to put a prayer request on the tomb of a Catholic woman who died 600 years ago. Yeah. Okay. You know, yep. that, and that says it all right there. Who, by the way, felt empowered enough to write the Pope angry letters about the. That's right. I, but I was going to get to that. Right. Oh, yeah. She was so disempowered. She had oh. no effect. No. <laughs> Catherine of Siena. She was a woman. So, you know, she was. She, she was no right sense. out. Yeah, no, it's just silly. <laughs> really silly, silly, silly. All right. Anyway, we could keep going and going and going. Thanks for being on the show, dude. It's always Pleasure great. To well, and and yeah. to those who are interested in our Vatican II series, uh, I think we've kind of completed Lumen Gentium and Dei Verbum. 
<coughs> no, we haven't completed Lumen Gentium. Two I more think. chapters of Lumen Gentium. That's right. Well, we'll finish that up soon. I'm going to Notre Dame this weekend for the Catholic Imagination Conference. Uh, and then after that, maybe you and I can dig down into that. All right. Thank, thanks, Rodney. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Bye now. <laughs>